Hi, I'm Scott Bradford from the Rio Grande Jewelry Tech Team, and today I'm going to be joined by my teammate, Greg Burgard. And we're going to be taking a walk through 3D manufacturing from concept to cast. So we're going to be uh, taking a quick demonstration of ZBrush. We're going to be looking at the Form 3 and the new CW40 castable wax. And then we're going to be casting on the NewTek J2R machine. So let's get started with ZBrush. So now we're in ZBrush. So I want to tell you a bit about how ZBrush works. It is a sculptural CAD software. So uh, what I mean by that is you're taking an existing object like a mesh and you're using traditional sculpting techniques to create the style that you want. So what I mean by traditional sculpting techniques is if I you know, handed you a ball of clay the things that you would be doing to that clay to make what you wanted to make are the exact same techniques that we actually use in this software. So what you're seeing on the screen here is actually more akin to traditional jewelry CAD software. This was actually made in Rhino, which is a NURBS modeler or commonly called a hard edge modeling program. So this is very typical of the kind of stuff you see in jewelry stores and, and things like that. Um, a lot of the jewelry programs are, are built on top of these kinds of programs. But what makes ZBrush unique is that it can, it can do this kind of hard edge modeling, but it can also do the more organic sculptural type stuff. The stuff that uh, these hard edge modelers tend to struggle with a little bit. So compare that to, let me bring up another ring here. So something like this, this skull ring here, would be incredibly difficult to make in a NURBS or hard edge modeling program. These kinds of uh, kind of sweeping curves and this type of detail uh, would be very tricky to do, but this is very much what ZBrush was made for. So it does it very easily. And the way it works is you're using what are called brushes. So in our brush menu, as you can see, there are a ton of different brushes to use. So they all work in different ways. There's ways to modify them or add on top of them. Uh, so you really have all the options in the world to create the designs you want. And then when you're ready, let me make a few quick adjustments here. You can start drawing on the surface. So I can control how much, how kind of, how strong these brushes are. Uh, I can control how large they are with my draw size and I can change the intensity as well. So I can kind of bring this up and start immediately drawing on my mesh in real time to create what I want to create. So it's super quick and, and we're working with a very high poly or high polygon model. So there's no lag or, or anything like that. So it just allows you to iterate quickly make different designs uh, and, and play, because you can actually draw right on the mesh. So that affords you some really sculptural type pieces. Uh, this piece here was actually sculpted by my teammate, Greg. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. So yeah, this kinds of stuff in a NURBS modeler would be incredibly difficult, where ZBrush just kind of is able to handle it. Now, we also have the option for things like textures. So if I bring in my signet ring here, this was actually a ring that I made in 3Design. So made in a hard edge modeling program and I brought it in ZBrush and was quickly able to put this texture on the outside of the ring. Uh, that's another thing that ZBrush handles really well is textures. Uh, again, with all the brushes, 
and the modifiers that you have at your disposal. Uh, these are things you can, you can iterate quickly uh, and, and have more time to design rather than figure out how you're going to create the design. So I was able to bring the ring in, make a little uh, seat for a, a stone. This was actually made for a boulder opal. Uh, and add the texture. Literally took a few minutes. So ZBrush, it really comes or is, has been widely embraced by the, the movie industry, the video game industry, things where these types of sculptural pieces are, are required. So, but, so you may not think that it has a lot to offer jewelry, but when you see some of the things you can do just using the tools in there, and plus there are extra add-ins as well. So uh, you can get add-ins for things like making rings uh, right off the bat. There are um, metal prices. So you can actually have a, a plug-in from Kitco Metal and actually find out how much metal your piece is going to be. And when you're ready, you can export it for 3D printing. Some of the, one of the ring utility plugins, you can actually bring in gemstones as well. So all of those are kind of in the software ready for you to, to bring into your designs and, and start adding them wherever you need to. So yeah, there, there is a lot to offer the jewelry industry and creating these organic shapes is just, it's, it's never easier than it is in ZBrush. Another thing is when, let's say, let's say you are getting into CAD design and you've never done it before. Um, there are training options available. Uh, this skull ring, uh, I actually sculpted based on lessons from the ZBrush Jewelry Workshop, uh, which was created by uh, Tomas Wittelsbach and his team. Uh, I highly recommend it as a, as a ZBrush training tool. Uh, they have tons and tons and tons of instructional videos. Uh, their, their teachers are amazing, and I highly recommend it if you're wanting to get into ZBrush. Uh, if you're already a CAD designer, say you're using one of these uh, NURBS modeling, like uh, you know, Rhino or Matrix or 3Design, ZBrush actually makes a useful addition because, uh, as I was showing you the signet ring earlier, this was actually made in 3Design brought into ZBrush, and then added the texture. So you can transfer these files back and forth and use them to their strengths. Um, you know, if you're comfortable with something like Rhino, you can crank out the basic design quickly, bring it into ZBrush, do the sculpting that you need to, and, and then export it for 3D printing. It's a really great addition. Um, cost about $895 for a lifetime license. Uh, once you buy the license, all the updates are free after that. So yeah, it's super affordable and you know, in relation to other CAD programs out there. So I really can't recommend it enough. Uh, if you want to download a trial and try it out for yourself, uh, you can go to pixelogic.com and, and download the trial. Uh, or if you want to just jump right in and buy the license, you can, you can buy that at riogrande.com. So that was ZBrush in a nutshell. Uh, the next thing, we would pull this file out as an STL file, and we're gonna transfer it to our Form 3. So follow me along, and we're gonna, we're gonna start 3D printing this model. Okay, so now we have our STL file. Uh, we can bring that into Preform, which is the software for the Formlabs printers, and start getting it ready to, for 3D printing. So Preform is effectively the software for kind of arranging things on the platform and adding our supports. So when we first boot it up, the first thing we're going to want to do is make sure that our printer is connected. And we're going to be printing in the new Castable Wax 40. And when you select your resin, as you can see, uh, Formlabs has a wide variety of resins to choose from. Uh, you'll have the option to select your resolution. So most of the castable materials will either be in uh, 50 microns or 25 microns. 
So I'm going to crank that up so we can get the highest resolution possible. And if you're new to 3D printing, Preform has a lot of training tools that will help you along through the process. When you first boot up Preform for the first time, uh, it's going to walk you through everything in the software and let you know what it is and what it's for. So there are a lot of handy tools in here to know how to orient something and where you need to add supports. So one of the first things you can do is what they call one-click print. So if I click one-click one print, it'll change the orientation, uh, it will add auto supports to everything, and then it will get it ready for 3D printing and it does it all for you. So uh, super quick, super easy. Uh, this is a great place to start. And, and there we go. And now I can actually upload it to the printer right now. Now, if you have been 3D printing, then there's also some tools in here that are, that's gonna allow you to uh, really dial in exactly what you wanna do. Uh, first off is our little slider here, so we can actually see the areas where we need to add more supports. And when it comes to things like orientation and supporting, you can actually select these individually from these menus on the left. So the orientation, I can, I can adjust how I need to. I can actually move it on the screen from, from this area and, and move it around the platform or even scaling if you need to scale something. Uh, supports, same thing. I can always do auto supports in the orientation that I choose or I can actually go in and individually add my own supports and it will let me know the areas that I need more supports, uh, these areas being red. So those, it's always going to call out these areas where you need more supports and it's constantly showing your uh, printability. So it's, it's super easy to get into uh, learning where the auto supports go and, and then you can actually start adding supports wherever you need to. So the, the customization in Preform is excellent. So for this one though, I'm just going to do some auto supports. So I'm going to go ahead and auto generate those. Uh, I like this orientation, so that's going to be just fine. And with CW40, uh, right now, there are quite a few supports because having a 40% wax content, it still requires uh, a little larger supports. Uh, you can experiment with uh, less supports, but uh, just be prepared to do a bit of testing there. So last thing we need to do is actually send it over to our printer. So once you have everything the way you want, uh, you can give it a name and then upload it to your printer. So, so now that that is generating all the slices and it's gonna be sending it over to the printer, let's go ahead and get the printer set up and ready. So the first thing we need to do is we need to make sure that the build platform is installed and there's nothing on it, so it's, Super simple to, to install, just push it in and lock the lever down. And these are the resin vats for the Form 3. Now, I wanna talk really briefly about how it works. So the film under these trays is flexible. When the light engine on the inside moves across this film, it pulls it taut, it prints the layer, and then it moves out of the way. So this film can very gently peel off that layer. Uh, it provides very low suction, so you can have, in most cases, smaller supports or less supports. Uh, they call this system low-force stereolithography, uh, and this is the, the main feature of the new Form 3. So once you have your tray, you can simply slide it in, press it forward, and you'll get audible feedback that the tray has been installed correctly. 
And then the last thing we need to do is just make sure that we have our cartridge installed. The, the Form 3 will actually dispense and monitor the amount of resin in it, so you don't have to do that. You don't, on those long prints, you don't have to keep checking to make sure you have enough resin. Uh, you can just pull the cartridge up, slide it into the back, and drop it in. And again, you get audible feedback that the cartridge has been installed. Now, we are going to be printing with the new Castable Wax 40. So, this is their newest castable resin. Uh, as I said, it does contain 40% wax. So, it is super clean to burn out. And as you can see, it affords you the opportunity to do these kinds of big stuff. So, you know, big chunky rings, uh, really thick cross sections. Uh, this, this resin is great for that. So if you want a sample, feel free to contact us at riogrande.com, or you can also contact Form Labs directly, and they can send you a sample print. I highly recommend trying it if you're going direct to cast. So once we have our print in the uh, internal memory, we can select it. It will give us our estimated print times. And I can go ahead and click print, and that's it. Uh, everything else, the, the printer will dispense the resin, it will monitor the resin, and once everything is ready to go, it will start on its own. So that's pretty much everything on the Form 3. Um, for treeing and casting, I'm going to be turning it over to my teammate, Greg Burkard. So let's, let's join him now. Okay, I just thought I'd uh, show you a little trick that I figured out for attaching some of these models to the tree because that's our next step. So what I like to use is uh, sticky wax. Uh, sometimes these models have a residue on them and it's a little bit hard to attach and the sticky wax really helps it stick. So let me show you how I do that. So here's one of the models and I'm going to take a little bit of sticky wax and attach it right here. I've already identified this as the, one of the heavier parts of the model. And you always want to try to put a feed gate to the heavier parts of the model for flow. So now I'm going to press that on a little bit. Then I'm going to go around the joint area and smooth it in, make a nice transition. You don't want to have any holes here because the holes will be filled by investment. And the investment, after the wax burns out, you'll have this little investment spike sticking in there that could mix in with your metal. Okay, so that's still a little hot. I'm going to let that cool for a second. Bring in the tree. I've already got one of them attached, and I'm just going to do the same thing with this one. So I need to attach that about the same height. We don't want to go higher. And I'm going to use the same sticky wax. I'm going to add a little bit here. And I'm going to add some to the feed gate, feed sprue. A little bit more. And I'm going to press that on and hold it for a second. Then I come in with more sticky wax and smooth out that transition too. Okay, there we go. There's a little spot there. Now we're ready to get a weight and do some casting, investing, and burnout. So that's some of my handy tips on attaching the models to the tree. Now let's go take a look at the J2R. So let me show you my favorite machine. This is the NewTek J2R. It is a closed system, digitally controlled vacuum casting machine. The reason it's my fav favorite machine is because it's easy to use. It gives me high quality, consistent, repeatable results. Now I mentioned closed system. What I mean by closed system basically is that while the metal is melting, it's protected from oxygen. 
And the way it does that is it pumps in nitrogen as a cover gas over the metal while it's melting. And that ultimately reduces, reduces uh, fire scale, fire stain, oxides, etc. It gives you better, a better surface quality. <clears throat> also, it's digitally controlled. So you have control all the way into the center of the melt. So here's what I mean. Here's a crucible, and you can see here's the hole in the middle. And that's where the metal flows down after it's, when you're ready to cast. This is a sealing rod. It seals the metal. While it's heating up, it closes up that hole. But there's a hole in the sealing rod where the thermocouple goes. This is plugged in to the controller up here. And it controls the temperature to plus or minus three degrees. So the importance of that is, let's say you had a really great casting. You could repeat that exactly and precisely. Or if you wanted, if you were a little too hot or a little too cold, you could tweak the temperature here, either up or down, just a couple of degrees. That would be almost impossible with a melting torch. So you can see how, how important it is to be able to control those factors. So now I'm ready to show you how to cast. So now we're going to be adding the metal. So you'll notice on the digital control here, I added about 190 grams of cold ancient bronze casting grain. Uh, so it's going to drop. It's going to drop quite a bit. And as soon as it bottoms out and starts to rise, that's when I'm going to go grab the flask. So now it's slowing down. It's about 150 degrees below the cast temp. Okay, so 922. So now it's going to start rising. So I'm going to turn on the vacuum. Put on my gloves. Grab my tongs. These are special tongs that just grab the, the flange of the flask that allow me to put it in. So let me go get the flask. Open the chamber, turn on the pump. Set it down in the center, close it up. You can see that we have vacuum, that's good. And now I'm just waiting for the temperature, the set temperature, or the actual temperature to reach the set temperature. So you saw me just go get the flask all by myself. This is a great machine for people who need to cast by themselves. As far as the flask and the tree goes, I used uh, plastic cast investment for 3D printed models. I mixed it at 38 to 100 with distilled water the, uh, the burnout cycle is, pretty, is a basic burnout cycle. We can include it, attach it in the documents if you want. Um, and I go a little bit hotter. I don't go to 1350, I go to 1400. And other than that, that's all there is to it. So we're just waiting. The metal is still not quite melted. about six or seven minutes from the time you add the metal. Okay, so here we are, ready to lift and cast. We have good vacuum. 
metals down. And that's it. So now I'm going to leave the I'm going to leave the 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 flask in here for about 90 seconds because the metal is still it's still fluid. It's not quite a solid yet. I need to give it time to fill out fill in all the details and pull into and solidify. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and shut off the power to the machine because we don't need to heat anything up. I'm done casting for the day. But I can leave the vacuum on for a couple seconds. Now I'm going to turn off the vacuum. And release the pressure. We're going to take the flask out. It's pretty hot. As you can see, it's still glowing. I'm going to set it over here with a charcoal block to absorb some oxygen and wait about 10 minutes. I'm going to set this timer. Then we'll quench. Okay, time to quench. Let's take this off. Okay, here we go. One deliberate motion under the water. I like to go even for a couple more seconds after it stops making noise just to make sure. So here's the cast, looks pretty good. Still needs a little more cleaning. And here's the same tree that we did. A little bit of cleanup on. You can tell it looks great. That's the way they come out. So thanks for watching. If you have any questions on any tools, equipment, or processes that we showed, be sure to contact us. Thank you.